Happy Thursday and welcome to another edition of Husker Online Headlines. Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple, as we're with you each and every week, going through the headlines, going through the news here as we get ready to hit the road to East Lansing, Michigan uh, tomorrow as uh, Sip and I and Robin will embark on the journey up to Michigan. But uh, before that, let's get into headlines. Headline number one, as we go through the big headlines of the week, what a grand mess the Big Ten is right now this season when you kind of look at it, uh, particularly the West. you got a four-way tie right now in the Big Ten West at the top. The East, I think it's still pretty wide open of those top three teams, but after that, you know, your guess is as good as mine as who the fourth-place team is in the East. It's probably Rutgers today. Mm-hmm. Uh, we thought it was Maryland at one point, um, but it, it is. I mean, this is – one of the more bizarre years of the Big Ten that we've seen since Nebraska's been in this conference. Yeah, it's kind of fun, though. I mean, it's and, and it's it's a mess in several ways. You could interpret mess in a few different ways. Um, it's a mess from the standpoint of Northwestern's been rocked by scandal. Iowa has a strange, in, kind of strange in-season firing with the word nepotism attached to the conversation. Well, the the Michigan saga we'll get into later. It's truly a scandal and saga. Michigan State, Mel Tucker. Um, <laughs> we don't even need to get into the detail. Then right. Kevin Sumlin with the Kevin, DUI. Yeah, it's it's a the Big Ten is is definitely this this season is a is a bit of a mess. I mean, there's probably something that we've forgotten. Um, Injuries. There's, yeah, there's so much that you don't even know what to say, but. You know, part of the conversation, and this is more, this is a more pleasant part of the conversation, is the Big Ten West race, which is a four team race. And here we are. I mean, it's Nebraska's right in it. And now this weekend is gigantic for Nebraska, for Wisconsin, for Minnesota, and Iowa. Yeah. And, and you look at, I mean, Minnesota's played itself back into it. They have mm-hmm. Ohio State left. Their running back last week had 40 carries. Yeah, I think he was a safety at some point this in year. In that win over Michigan State. I mean, yeah. So. No, Minnesota is squarely in it. In fact, I've said, I think, on our show that if I had to pick a team right now, and I get it, they play Ohio State, I would still pick Minnesota because they have the potential to have all the tiebreakers, win against Iowa, win against Nebraska, play Wisconsin late on their home field. And guess who has the best quarterback play of those four teams? I think it's Minnesota. It's not even close right now. <laughs> Wait a second. You think so? Think about okay, Iowa. No, no. Wisconsin. No, no. no. Um, Nebraska. And Nebraska. No. Come on. And <laughs> Minnesota. I mean, they, they're got, not great at quarterback though. Well, he's still yeah pretty pretty, pretty manageable. Yeah, I mean, he's yeah. You're probably right. I mean, that throw the throws he made to beat Nebraska were pretty good. Yeah, he's the best one. I mean, yeah, so he's like. The best one. This division in general, I mean, you think about what's happened to it year over year. You eliminate Scott Frost, Jeff Brom, and Paul Christ. Three excellent offensive minds. Yeah. Three excellent play callers that were all fired or moved on last year. Fitzgerald, not a play caller. Not a play caller, but an identity. Yeah. He had an identity. Yeah. <laughs> Brian Ferentz also eliminated <laughs> technically. But, you know, it, it's just – it's wild fascinating what's happened to this division i mean yeah and you know luke fickle trying to kind of force his new system in at wisconsin with really the, without the horses to run it yet yeah but i want to get into this iowa discussion oh please because it is added to this that's the story of the week in the big 10 west and really the big one of the big stories in the big 10 and we'll get into the other one later here with michigan um but brian ference was fired but he'll coach the final four games in the midst of a six and two season and when you look at this situation as a guy that's been around a lot of situations at Nebraska, it reminds you of some of the dysfunctional things that we've seen in our time at Nebraska. How so? Here you have the all-time winningest coach in Iowa's history, Kirk Ferentz, who probably was thinking about retirement, You know, was probably thinking about this maybe could be his last year um, and whatnot. They fire his son but say, you're going to keep coaching. And by the way, we're not going to th- – he didn't have any real say-so or – knowledge of how the you know just the proper kirk Kirk did not have any knowledge of this and it was out of his control a guy that's probably been in control of every iowa football decision for the last 20 years in the midst of a possible big 10 west championship season 
they can as sun. And what what's it remind you of? It reminds you a lot of just some of the things we've seen here with yeah, with just administrational people stepping in. I mean, think about like upper level. Okay, Tom Osborne for what he did for Nebraska as the AD, you know, stabilized the program, got him in the Big Ten. I think was led to believe he was going to be able to help name his successor at mm-hmm. Nebraska. He was not allowed to name his successor. In fact, no. he didn't even know if Sean Eichhorst was a candidate, let no, alone got the job. Reminded me something like that. I mean, just situations right. that we've seen here over the years where admin kind of meddled and made decisions over the top. I mean, Billy Devaney is a great example. Sean Eichhorst puts in Billy Devaney, and basically that structure fired the defensive coordinator over the head coach, Mike yeah. Riley. Oh, yeah. I mean, you go back. We got a lot of those here. To chancellor decisions. And what, what you're talking about when you say administration, you're talking about chancellors, presidents, and ADs. And there's been there's been too many missteps and too many poor decisions at that level about football, about football matters to count. I mean, so, yeah, if I were Iowa – if I were an Iowa, if I were Kirk Ferentz, if I were anybody that that cares about Iowa and has um and has anything to do with Iowa football, I would I would look at Nebraska and say, okay, so what what's going on here? It looks like your president wants more power in the decision making about football, and your AD wants more power. Oh, you better you better make damn sure that those people know what they're doing, because at Nebraska they didn't. And there were decisions made that put Nebraska in an incredible tailspin. I mean, which we're still Nebraska still trying to pull out of. And Kirk Ferentz, to his credit, he's a classy politician on the mic. He's saying the right things, but do not kid yourself. He's oh, freaking upset. It's rough behind the scenes. He is upset. He's hurt. Yeah, you know it. it I mean. They shamed him and his family essentially this week. Yeah. I mean, I get it. their offense has been crummy, but they lost their starting quarterback. They lost their two NFL type tight ends. Mm-hmm. Every offense in the Big Ten West has been poor this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, it'll be, I mean, <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say, it's interesting to hear him defend this guy like this. Were you defending Nebraska coaches like this? You know, well, we've we've lived through it though, and we've right. seen the results of right. what happens right. when non-football people make football decisions. Right. Like, in what world does it make any sense to fire your offensive coordinator with four games remaining? It, and Sean, I'm with you. It doesn't make a lot of sense in the midst of a chance to win the division. Right there's and, and my, she's not in she the AD. It's Beth Getz. She hasn't really said why. You know, I mean, now some people say, okay, what do you mean? You need an explanation. They are a terrible offense and they've been a bad offense since 2017, basically when Brian Ferris took over. So you have to acknowledge that, but you're right. It's a complicated, it's a complicated discussion because football discussions often are because they are six and two, not because of the offense, but they are six and two. So, and then I just think public sentiment, Sean, enters into it, right? I guarantee you there's people in Iowa that are applauding today. Or oh, yeah. they were applauding Tuesday whenever it happened, right? So they have public sentiment to think about. They also have re- – now, this is your area of expertise, Sean. They have recruiting to think about. Could they send Brian Ferentz out to recruit a quarterback? Probably not. Nah, see, you got to think and about they, that. They had to pay – Pretty good money to get Cade McNamara there. They're they're sw- the Swarm Collective, which is their collective there. Swarm, um, you know, they had to work to get Cade McNamara there. They thought they had a solution, um, and I do believe if Cade McNamara and those tight ends are healthy, they probably are the best team in the West right now. I one well, let me ask you this: they would, they still might be the best team in the West. They might be. What if Nebraska had all its players available? True. I mean, I mean, you're talking about eight basically, right? I mean, you're talking about the top two running backs, the top four receivers. That's and six. Top three offensive line. Yeah. So you're getting to nine. I mean, so I know I'm with you, though. If you had Luke Lachey and Eric All, that's who you're talking about, the tight ends, and McNamara, different. You're having a different conversation about Iowa. The other thing, though, too, in the, the timing of this was not rushed. I mean, the, the David Eichold report did not rush this, is what I was told. It was always going to come out Monday, no matter okay. what. Really? All, yeah. The, the report. 
And I'm thinking more, why? Well, what if they would have won the division? How awkward would it have been? Here's your Big Ten West champions. Oh, and by the way, we're firing the offense. Well, I mean, think about it. Just look at their schedule. They're going to play Northwestern at Wrigley on, on Saturday. Seven and two. Good chance to be seven and two. Then they got Rutgers at home. At home. That's a good matchup. It is. It's a good matchup, but it's at home eight and two. You're right. You can't. Okay. And doesn't it feel like Nebraska? Like we've had these kind of conversations at Nebraska. Are they really going to fire a guy who won nine games that just won on Iowa's home field? They're going to fire a guy who just won at Iowa and got his ninth win. Yeah, they are. They did. Um, and you, you, you recalled a conversation you had with John Papusha's in 2014, the year they fired Bo Pelini after winning at Iowa. And what did John tell you when they were eight and one? That so year? November 15th, at, going in, after a bye week, Nebraska was in Wisconsin. They're eight and one. And on that bye week, Papuchas, and this was a summer interview from this past summer for a book I'm working on that's done. And and he said, um, in my wildest dreams, I'm sitting on my bye week watching college football with my oldest son. I never would have thought we'd get fired at eight and one. Eight ever. and one. We're ranked 11th going into Madison, Wisconsin with a chance to win the West. Yeah, and, then, then, Ma then the Madison happened, though. Well, then they, then they blew it against Minnesota. Right. But I still think if they beat Minnesota and they finish 10 and two, they still want to fire Bo. I, I, I was hoping you'd say that and not, I think they would have saved their job. I don't think so. 10 and two, and that would have been nuts. <laughs> Yeah, in the context we're living in right now, right. Oh, it's still nuts, but it's not. Yeah, no matter what, right? I mean, but when admin have their mind made up, they have their mind made up. Uh huh. Like, and they, and I wonder if I was admin, administration, president, AD, regions. have decided that we have to start moving on from the Ferentz era. Well, the the regents, regents, the president, and I think the AD is working for them, mm -hmm. but the regents and the president there. I think it's clear they want to change. They want to kind of turn the page. Do you think so? Now, I don't know that. I, you know, that's your you know, that's, just sources I've talked to. Okay. Iowa. Sources okay. I, this is not, I mean, this is direct. And this, these are good sources. Oh, they want, okay. That's like they're, fascinating, they're, Sean. They, they, there's, there's, they want to change there. I th and I think with the Big Ten West closing shop here after this year, it makes a little bit of sense because it kind of does, but it won't make sense if they went out. <laughs> it won't make sense. It'll be hard to do if they well, went out. Then, like, it would be kind of a tense situation for the next guy. <laughs> Absolutely. If they go. But do you think Chris Kleiman or Lance Leipold? I mean, those are two logical guys at Iowa, by the way. If that job opened. Real logical. Like, those are the first two calls I would make yep. if I was doing that job search. Yeah. But do you think they want to walk into a situation where it's rocky? I mean, it depends how much you're motivated by money. I mean, they're going to get paid a lot of money. Kleiman and Lance could just say, hey, we like the Big 12 right now. We're, we have a clear shot to go to the playoff every year. One team from the Big 12 will go to the playoff no matter what. I think Leipold would be much more apt to take it than Kleiman. That's and Gene, I think. Well, and Gene Taylor was the deputy AD at Iowa for Gary Barda. Okay. And then he went to K State to become the AD. You know, let's not act like we don't know some of this stuff. You know the dynamic at Kansas State. Don't you think it would be hard to wrestle climbing out of Manhattan? Especially with Gene Taylor. Um, they're they're best friends. Right. I mean, that's like a modern day Joe Castiglione, Bob Stoops, Gary Barda, uh um, now here's Ferentz type relationship there. Sorry to interrupt. That Beth Getz is an interim AD at Iowa. Now she's got some steam I've heard for to become the permanent, but would Gene Taylor be interested in becoming the? Could the scenario play out that Gene Taylor and Kleiman go to Iowa? Yeah, I mean, a lot I don't of know. Them, I don't could. Know. I mean, Kansas State, I don't think could match Iowa's money. They could match Big Ten money. If 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 you really wanted to write Big Ten checks, they couldn't write. I mean, a Big Twelve team can't no. match that. No, they can't. It's why a coach. In the Big Twelve, Sean, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this off the cuff. It's why a coach in the Big Twelve might consider Indiana because of the Big Ten money. Well, yeah, because you can because pay you're your, getting much more money. You can pay your assistant coaches in the Big Ten seven hundred, six hundred thousand versus two or three hundred thousand in the right. Big Twelve. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. All so right. now that Climb and Taylor scenario probably hasn't been discussed hardly at all, even in Iowa, because all this is pretty new. This is. Like that information you're getting your, from your sources about 
sort of a power struggle. All pretty new, I think. But I don't think Beth Getz is going to be like, well, let's bring in Gene Taylor now. I've done all the dirty work and cleaned out the farm. No, she's not. She wants the, she wants the job. job. Yeah, it's going to get – I think it could get – now, the other thing to add to this conversation is what I've been told is, is Kirk was used to having all that administration behind him. I mean, having the president, having regents, having the AD. Well, obviously, Gary Barta was I mean, like his best friend. Uh, yeah. He's, and now he's got to get used. He doesn't have to, but if he wants to continue to be Iowa's coach, he has to get used to a different leadership dynamic. What well, he has his own, and we're talking a long time on headline number one here, but I think it's interesting. Kirk Ferentz has his own PR firm that represents him. Oh, he's, yeah. The PR firm's probably been busy. Yeah. Yeah. He's sort of a, a corporation unto himself. The Ferentz name is a corporation unto itself at Iowa. Very interesting power struggle. I, I'm portraying it as a power struggle. And we'll we better just, move on. People right. are, are people gonna say, What are you guys talking about? Let's do an Iowa show. All right, before we get Husker to online. headline number two, Husker Online Headlines brought to you by CHI Health and my provider match. I love my provider at CHI Health Clinic. Did you know that CHI Health has created an online quiz to match you with a provider that matches your personality? It's that easy. Go to myprovidermatch.com, answer a few questions, and be matched with a provider who understands your health goals, including primary care and women's health providers, pediatricians, and cardiologists. Uh, I just went into CHI Health, saw uh, my doctors there this past week. It is such an easy process there to find the right fit for you. Love that brand new location as well on 40th and Yankee Hill. Uh, they have so many different services in there from dermatology to cardiologists to just uh, urgent care uh, to your regular doctors. So um, it's a great, great system that they offer here uh, with myprovidermatch.com. Uh, check them out online at CHI Health at myprovidermatch.com to find the provider that best fits your personality. All right, let's take it to headline number two. Can this Nebraska offense clean up its act in East Lansing, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna look at the weather again here because I, I think yeah, the weather is gonna be somewhat favorable. Okay, and you look for Saturday, high of 53 with clouds. So, hopeful the wind is not a factor because uh, Michigan State's pass defense has been suspect, and if if it is, and they can get some runs going, maybe they can find a couple of those freshmen over the top <laughs> on the belly G option. They're, everyone's gonna be. To the point where they're going to be over ready for that play. So I think mm -hmm. you have to almost kind of use it against defenses. 100%. Now there's like an, an adjustment you make. Like every time that those freshmen are out there and they're in that formation, teams are going to be ready for that. Yeah, you have to anticipate the defense's adjustment and then make an adjustment. I think. I mean, we're not – neither of us have coached a game in our lives, right? No, you got to yeah. sell it hard, though. Right. Um, can Nebraska's offense clean up its act? What that means to me is minimize turnovers. They had five, they had five, well, five fumbles last week, four loss. That right, Sean? Five fumbles last week, four loss. Nebraska leads the nation in turnovers. Um, I mean, they they're they've been horrendous in that in that regard. In fact, Marcus Satterfield, bless his heart, said this week it's driving us insane. He said that on the statewide radio. It's driving us insane. Um, he 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 said, Sean, they we hate ourselves for it. I mean, it's it's being addressed. It's got. I'm glad. I'm kind of glad it hasn't taken over the conversation. It doesn't feel like it's taken over the the converse the the big picture conversation because Nebraska has done so many things right to get to this point. You know, on defense, but. Also, some things on special teams and offense. But I guess the best way to sum it up is they're not going to win the Big Ten West if they keep turning it over at this rate. Well, they're fortunate on a few things. They're fortunate they have a good, a good defense, number one. Yep. And they're fortunate they're not seeing offenses like Colorado right. every week. Because we saw what happened when get, you play you an offense out. like Colorado and you turn it over. Look what happened that game. I know. Isn't it interesting, though? They 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 fumbled five times and lost four and still handled Purdue easily pretty much Sean thirty one well, to fourteen pretty easy game the wind and the conditions for the defense in general it was like a twelfth man at times yeah I mean the way the wind knocked those deep balls down and Tommy Hill got that pick I mean it, it just that was not a day where you were going to be able to come back from three possessions down no, no. you're playing with fire like. 
I don't want to, but I don't want to say, Sean, if they're minus two on Saturday against Michigan State, they'll never win. No, I'm not going to say that. They might. They but could, they this, could probably this win. This is why they won. They did put together the longest Nebraska drive we've seen since 2016. 15 plays, 87, 87 yards. Almost nine minutes. Yeah, 852. And it makes sense that was the longest drive because in the Frost era, they ran no huddle. So if there was a 15 play Frost drive, there was going to be a lot of no huddle involved, right? Right. Where right. Nebraska, they methodically huddle. We've seen Satterfield run a little no huddle, not much. Yeah, they, they ran some tempo. Against Northwestern. Yeah, they ran some tempo against Northwestern. Just to right. kind of wake it up a little bit. Yeah, it's not a bad kind of uh, change-up pitch to use, right? Because no one's expecting it. I mean, Nebraska hadn't shown tempo really all year. It's sort of a bad analogy because you know, usually associate a change-up with a slope. slope but, they, but they picked up the pace against – you're right. They, never, they hardly ever do that. It's something to keep in mind, though. Um, cause you, cause it can provide a spark, but as far as the turnovers go, I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody does. Well, some of the situations could have been prevented like Harburg on the one fumble. He took maybe the hardest shot of the season. And then they call like a quarterback option kind of ball handling play the next play. That was when he fumbled. So could you have said, all right, hey, Harburg just got his bell rung. You literally got slammed to the ground by a grizzly bear. I mean, like <laughs> it looked like he got picked up and slammed to the ground by – And what was the call, play call on the down? They, they called like an option or okay. a keeper type play, and he fumbled. Mm. Um, the play before, what was it? A scramble where – Oh, he, he scrambled. It was a pocket. pass play. Yeah, and, and he was kind of scrambling around. He got hit. All of the sacks on Pro Football Focus were charged to Harburg mm. because, you know, he left the framework of the play and held the ball too long. Yes, people are going to say, Sipple, were you not watching the game? And I, I would tell them, no, I wasn't. I was writing my column. I was writing the Nebraska wins column. So that was in the fourth quarter, and I kind of would, I kind of was writing. But anyway, the okay, so. Well, then Jeff Sims, could that play could have been prevented because they, they didn't need to run that fourth down play. No, they didn't. So two of the four fumbles were preventable. The Garrett Snodgrass one was just a guy putting his helmet on the ball. Right. John Bullock, the wind tricked him. Alex. Or Alex Bullock, the wind tricked him on the punt. Uh -huh. they, they got lucky and recovered that one. Newsom, return, uh, uh, Newsom recovered it. The other fumble, was it? Um, Two times Harburg, Harburg, once Sims, and once Alex Bullock. Those were the fumbles. So I, don't, I can't remember them all. I just know Nebraska's minus nine turnovers on the season. And, if Sean, if you look at the teams in the FBS – if you just look at the teams that are anywhere from minus seven in the turnover category to minus 15, none of them are winning except one. Who's winning? Nebraska. None of them are winning. Because they have an elite defensive unit. UCF is three and five. These are all teams minus seven in turnovers to minus 15. There's not that many. The problem U with the UCF is three and five. Akron's one and seven. Arizona State's two and six. Texas Tech's three and five. Temple's two and six. Hawaii's minus 15, 2 and 7. Army's 2 and 6. Michigan State, 2 and 6. But so much of that was in the first two weeks, and they lost both those games. When yeah. the, I mean, the margin's at where it's at. Good point. Because of what happened the first two weeks. And they've not been, I mean, it's like they they put up this expensive debt that they can't get, get off the books. I mean, that's a good analogy. They went to an expensive. They ordered too much. Yeah. they're they're in debt. I mean, yeah. they're not they're not going to clear that turnover margin. They put that on their credit card. They're not going to get it paid back <laughs> for a while. They, they added a side of a lobster tail and a crab leg. I mean, they're not going to they're not going to clear that debt off unless there. they come into some serious money. You know. <laughs> All right. On that note, let's take it to headline number three. Uh, brought to you by Caldera Lab. I've been telling you about Caldera Lab all year. It is a great men's skin care product. And I know you're like, why do you need men's skin care products? It's a, you're, you're not tough like Steve Sipple if you use Caldera Lab. But well, let me tell you, you want to take care of yourself. You want to use your face as an important part. It's just as important as brushing your teeth. Uh, Caldera Lab, 94% of men have seen results by using Caldera Lab. It is an easy three-step process that takes 30 seconds. Uh, you put it on in the morning. You put it on at night. And boom, you're you're good, and you feel fresh. Your skin feels uh, good. You see the results every day when you use the product, uh, Caldera Lab. And we've got a great special right now for our Husker Online headline listeners. Right now, uh, go to CalderaLab.com. Promo code Husker will get you twenty percent off. 
Once again, that is calderalab.com, promo code Husker, to receive 20% off your first order here of Caldera Lab. Thank you again to Caldera Lab for sponsoring us here on Husker Online Headlines. All right, let's go to headline number three. Are we overlooking what an excellent coaching job rule has done to position Nebraska for a division crown? I think we're like a if they get to bowl eligibility. Okay. And okay. I thought about this. Oh, that's a good point. Like, would rule? I mean, if the, if rule gets him to like eight and four, I'm not nine and three. It's a whole different. But if they if they get to eight and four, would he receive some consideration for Big Ten Coach of the Year? Or does it automatically go to the Big Ten East winner? <laughs> you think they, you think it'd go to Harbaugh? Or minus Harbaugh. <laughs> That's the, you think Harbaugh will be the Big Ten Coach of the Year this year? Okay, so give me this scenario: Michigan goes twelve and zero, right? Nebraska eight and four. Let's not say nine and three. Just, just take Harbaugh out of it, please. But who gets Big Ten Coach of the Year? I don't know, but it's not Jim Harbaugh. <laughs> like, who gets it? Um, I, I think that if Rule got Nebraska to eight. Then he would He'd have to be a votes. he would have to be a seri under serious consideration. Now Ryan Ryan Day at Ohio State, if if they would win the East, I would I would probably vote for Ryan Day to be for honest. sure. Well, he he, beat, he won at Notre Dame. <coughs> He's beat Penn State. Won at Wisconsin, and you know, and then he'd have a game against Michigan. Right. So Ryan Day, if they go undefeated, will get it. Right. But what if Ryan Day gets drilled by Harbaugh, which I expect, by the way. So then who? I. I don't know. You'd have to wait for I don't know when they cast that vote, by the way. I hope it's late because you'd have to wait to almost see how it's the West. You'd have to wait to see how the West shakes out. You could make a case if Northwestern wins a couple more. Couldn't you make a case for Braun? Yeah, if Northwestern gets the six or seven wins, right. Braun, Braun. You'd have to make a case for him because going into the season, what was the narrative? Oh, God, they might not win two. You know? I think he has a shot at that job now. <laughs> yeah. That's listen, Sean. I hope I hope Northwestern is very careful with that because that just screams emotional decision. When there's guys sitting out there that have coached, been head coaches at multiple schools, have success at multiple schools that probably they could get, and you hire a guy in his first time who caught a wave. I don't know. I, that strikes me as an emotional decision, but especially when you have Big Ten money. But back to rule, yeah, I think rule. The thing that's nobody's talking about is all the in. It doesn't seem like we talk about the injuries much. Sean, I'm going to tell you something right now. If if Ohio State lost its top two running backs, its top four receivers, and three offensive linemen, what would Ohio State be without Marvin Harrison? Yeah, and and whatever the the, the egg, egg boo, whatever his name is. If you took if you if you took that off of any team. If Georgia was without its top two running backs, its top four receivers, and three offensive linemen, I don't think we'd be talking about Georgia being a national title contender. I don't think so. And so, so you take that off Nebraska, and they're still in position to win their division. I, I think it's been a hell of a coach. And Matt Rule will be the first to tell you, like, this is not like. The final product of what Nebraska is going to be under him, but he's Same close. Guess what he's doing? He's coaching, and you know when when you go to war or battle, sometimes you don't have the best army, right? But you you know what you got to do? What? Figure out how to win. Well, you know what else you have to do, and this is the essence of the discussion. If I'm if I'm a voter, and, I, and I'm trying to determine who the coach of the year is in anything, I'm looking to see who maximized, who maximized their roster. Right? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> who I can text message while I'm listening? Who who ma who maximized? And right now, you would say Nebraska is maximizing, maximizing. I, like you can't say that about everybody. Well, they were picked fifth in the West, and if they can win the West, I mean, I think he you'd be gonna... maximized. Yeah, he yeah, you'd be you'd you'd maxed out if you win the West. I mean, Harburg wasn't even on the travel roster late last year. Right. So right. yeah, there's there's a lot there to to discuss, and and we're jumping the gun, and we're getting to really, and we're getting a little big picture. And I know Coach Rule doesn't like to be big picture, but we, we can um, get big picture with our our thoughts on this. All right, um, before we get to headline number four, Husker on the headlines, brought to you by Bauer 
underground. They're helping shape Nebraska's infrastructure future, and they're looking for new members to join the team with open positions for laborers, equipment operators, aerial linemen, and foremen. Bauer Underground is searching for the best in construction. Visit BauerUnderground.com to learn more about career opportunities and industry-leading benefits, including competitive pay, employer-paid health insurance, dental, disability, vision, and life insurance, 401k match, new top-of-the-line equipment, and a clothing allowance. No experience in uh, underground construction, no problem. Bauer will train the right people in the field, giving you the hands-on experience that you need to build a long and rewarding career. Want to learn more? Visit Bauer Underground on Facebook to view testimonials from current Bauer teammates, hear about their experiences, the company culture, and the importance of their work. Bauer Underground is family-owned with crews and work sites across Nebraska. Wherever you live, Bauer has an opportunity for you. For more information, like Bauer Underground on Facebook or visit BauerUnderground.com. Come start your new career today. <laughs> All right, headline number four, and this is going to be an interesting discussion, Steve Sipple. Mm -hmm. Big Ten coaches yesterday oh, yeah. met with the commissioner, <laughs> Tony Petiti. They had the first 30 minutes were standard business. The next 60 minutes, Jim Harbaugh got off the call and everybody just went off about Michigan, Jim Harbaugh, what's going on. Um, there was a, a few reports now out there. Pete Thamel talked to five anonymous coaches. The call was heated. It was emotional. There was a lot of upset coaches about what Michigan was able to get away with the last what, three What seasons. do the coaches want? The coaches want immediate action by Tony Petiti. And the Big Ten is the only people right now that can do something immediately. The NCAA has a long process with how they do things. Now, the Big Ten, though, has a sportsmanship clause. If a team does not act in good sportsmanship, the commissioner has the ability to step in. And do what? And punish. Okay. People keep saying they want action. What action do you want? You want to you take Michigan out of the playoff? How, how much money are you going to cost your conference? You want to take Michigan out of the playoff, or or you could suspend Harbaugh more. He's already been suspended. They won all the games. He's suspended already. Here's the thing: think about this stuff. You want to you want to take that playoff. It could be the Big Ten playoff, or the Big Ten championship game that we're talking about, and it could be the Final Four. Sean, you know what's happening here? You're punishing the players for something they had nothing to do with. Do you understand? Oh yeah. You're punishing players for something they had nothing to do with. I I don't. Tony Petiti's got a, a difficult decision here. You're gonna take that. You're gonna take the Big Ten, the possibility of playing for the Big Ten championship and the national championship away from JJ McCarthy for what? What did he do? I mean, nothing. The players did nothing. Yeah, and that so they get penalized. The coaches created an unfair competitive advantage, and we, uh, Andy Staples from On Three interviewed Matt Rule on Thursday. And, you know, he um, addressed a lot of this with Coach Rule um, on there. And Coach Rule wouldn't get into too many of the specifics about the call, but it was very interesting just to hear uh, the call. Or I the, get it. Everybody's screaming, take action, Tony Petiti, Big Ten. Okay, what action are we talking about? What action? I think the only thing you could probably get away with is suspending Harbaugh. Am I right? But, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what people I don't know exactly what people want. The other question I have is okay, now does are you suggesting that the Big Ten investigates? Do they have do they have an investigative body that can do this, Sean? Well, and how okay. much how much so there was a private investigative firm that was evidently hired to kind of sniff this case out. My guess is some Big Ten schools were involved. And getting this firm in well, place. and the Big Ten could hire a firm if they don't have their own team. But there's already evidence in place, tickets, purchases that were bought. Well, um, we haven't heard Michigan's side of this story. Okay, there's a little discomfort I have. We've heard all of this commentary about it, but we hear nothing from Michigan. Right? Nothing. You can't. You can't really hear anything from Michigan. So I'm not defending Michigan. What Michigan has done apparently is just brazenly broke the rules. I mean, just shoved it in our face almost. Sean, there's been scandal in college football before. I mean, there's been steroid stuff, right? Um, there's been all there's been 
all different sorts of scandal. This, this is but rarely ultimate. do you see it this brazen and this in your face. Just the gamesmanship involved. Like well, yeah, where, it's, where, it's, where they had an intricate. I mean, it's Houston Astros. Right. You know, I don't know that I'd even characterize this gamesmanship because gamesmanship suggests a level of disguise. They didn't even really try to disguise this very well. And now now they're getting now they're getting busted. Um, but will will something happen? This season, Sean, Sean, the thing you got to wonder about is, are you suggest that Michigan shouldn't be able to compete for the national title? What is Tony? How much money will that cost the Big Ten? Well, I'm, would that cost the Big if, Ten? <laughs> I'm going to use like a 2009 or 2010 Nebraska going to the Big 12 analogy. Like, if, you know, like the A&M game where all the penalties were called on Nebraska to prevent Nebraska from getting a BCS at large bid. You just wonder... <laughs> How that game will go in Columbus? Will, will some of the breaks and 50 50 calls you know. be slanted a little bit towards the bucket? I mean, there's going to be those conspiracies thrown out there. Am I right? Yeah, it's really created an uncomfortable situation for sure. And and the other dis, the other part of the discussion that I don't know if I were Tony Patini would make me very dis, it would be very uncomfortable. Is we could be looking at the 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 crumbling of Michigan football i mean they built it back up i don't know why do people think about this michigan found its coach finally finally they went through a succession of coaches that were subpar michigan's back and it's beautiful for the big 10 but it looks like this might be it you wonder um i i haven't really heard urban meyer i heard urban meyer heard, heard what he said he doesn't believe it because he doesn't believe the media he says that if this happened, it's unlike anything we've seen, any anything he's seen in forty years. He's I I I heard what Urban said yesterday. He said if this is true, that it's something that he's he's never seen anything like this in forty years of coaching. Now, what he said though is I'm not sure I believe it because I don't trust media. So I it was kind of a bad take by Urban. I thought one well, and there are definitely a lot of people <laughs> that don't like Jim Harbaugh. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a pain in people's ass, right? I mean, mm -hmm. he, he's not a likable guy. Oh, he to like other coaches. You go, he he's a competitor. Yeah, and, I think I he's mean, a likable guy, but I mean, there aren't a lot of people that to say I love Jim Harbaugh. Like, I mean, I, that have to compete against him for recruits in in the conference. Oh no, those people wouldn't. If you're competing against him, you wouldn't like him. And at then all. you find out, oh, he knows everything we're calling. That's bad. And why is it bad? Because if it's not bad, signal signal stealing goes on everywhere, obviously. Um, but it doesn't go on to the extent where you can enter a week of practice Monday, and you know all the opponent signs and can and gear your practice accordingly. That's cheating. That's you've created an unfair advantage, and that's that's what coaches are hot about. Sean, wait a second. They knew going into their week of practice what we would be running at when when this sign was made. Yeah, it's trouble. And Michigan kind of played like that. It looked like they had to jump on people. The the Nebraska game in 2021 was almost an anomaly that Frost had them off balance. Strange, yeah. When like, you think you about think about yeah. that, I mean Nebraska yeah. had them strange off balance. Because you know why? Because they run no huddle. They hurry up and go, go, go. Yeah. Harbaugh after that game was probably like stallions get in my office right now. What the hell was that? We didn't know what was coming. I mean, Levi Falk like broke free for a big touchdown. I mean, it, like it was. I mean, that was like, even though it was a loss, it was one of the high moments of the Frost era. Just oh, that, it was a great game that night, the atmosphere. Um, but Michigan, how, they, did they only lose one conference game in the last three years? And I think so. Harbaugh. Now, to be fair, Harbaugh has said he no, knows nothing of any of this, which is what you say. I, yeah, I don't believe him. How could you? How could you believe him? How would he not know? When, when Stallions is standing next to his coordinator on the sideline, only steps from Harbaugh. You don't know who that kid was that was talking to your coordinator and telling him what we're doing? Well, they had, Oh, they you have, don't know that? They have sheets with the guys doing the signals. Yeah. All right, let's close it out, Steve Sipple. Headline number five. And before we get to that, Husqvarna Headlines brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is super easy to use. You go to the app, you make a pick, whether your favorite player will have higher or lower on the stat line, what is listed. 
You do that with two to five players. Your business, if you go five for five, you can win 20 times your money. For example, if you're watching this Thursday, you might want to put an entry uh, in the game with Tampa and Buffalo. That was last Thursday game. Or, you know, Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes. Uh, any any of your favorite players, college, pro, any sport, um, it's very simple. And if you hit all five, you win 20 times your money. You can do uh, two two picks, three picks, four picks, whatever. Um, it's so easy. It's a fun way to watch. we got a great special as well for our Husker Online users. Uh, go to underdogfantasy.com uh, by using the promo code Husker, and you'll get your first deposit match of up to $100 doubled uh, that's once again underdog fantasy promo code husker to get that first deposit match of a hundred dollars doubled you must be 18 and present in a state where underdog fantasy operates terms apply concerned with your play call 800-522-4700 or visit ncpgambling.org thank you again to underdog fantasy all right steve sipple mm -hmm. let's close it out with some schedule talk we now know Nebraska's 2024 schedule, the dates. <laughs> and let me tell you, it's it's a great schedule. I mean, great from the standpoint of, okay, August 31st, home against UTEP. It's the first time since 2019, Nebraska will actually open with a non-conference game. I'll be damned. So yes. that's a, and, in Lincoln. And UTEP's not good. In Lincoln. And UTEP's not good. No. I mean, you're not playing BYU here or right. somebody like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great game to open. Then you have Colorado in Lincoln, September 7th. Big. Then you got Northern Illinois, or Northern Iowa on September 14th okay. in Lincoln. Then the fourth game, Illinois conference opener, home game in Lincoln. So your first is, four games of Matt Rule's second year wow. home games. Wow. Wow. They did catch a break at Purdue. And then you're at Purdue September 28th for okay. your first road game. Very manageable road trip. Yep. Now that... You wonder, could that be a Friday night game? Or could, you know, th there, there's a potential yes. of a Friday night game on Yes, here. it could. Rutgers comes to Lincoln on October 5th. Okay. Great, great um, matchup there. Then you get a bye. It's a two bye year, by the way. You get a bye, and you get, then you go on the road. Then you get Indiana on the road, uh, um, which is obviously Tom Allen may or may not be there. That's a winnable opportunity on the road. Then you go to Columbus for your by far toughest game of the season, more than likely on paper. Yep. Uh, for the yep. Buckeyes, for October, sure, October twenty sixth by far. Then you get UCLA, the <laughs> West Coast boys. Hey, let's come to Lincoln on November second and let's bring some twenty mile an hour north winds and maybe right. some snow. Isn't that a day where you hope for rugged weather? Yes. Matt Rule, let's be clear on that. That's not Sipple and Sean just talking. Matt Rule, Matt Rule likes it that way. He wants nebraska to have that advantage he gears practice towards it i think they'll, they'll want they'll want gray miserable 25 20 yeah 25 maybe 15 degree with wind chill that'd be perfect so then november 9th by number two and the reason some people ask this question why are there two buys yeah why well, is there two buys five, uh, two out of seven years um there's 14 saturdays um between Labor Day and Thanksgiving. Then the other five out of seven, there's 13. So we're on a run now where there are 14 Saturdays instead of 13. So when there's 14 Saturdays that fall between Labor Day and Thanksgiving, you get two bye weeks. When Sean, Sean, you could be you you could be a travel agent, and sometimes I wonder you might be able to be a TV executive too. <laughs> but it, it's a it's a great deal for inventory. And there's thought that hey, why not just make it a 14 week season every year? and put on the years where there's not the 14 Saturdays between Labor Day and Thanksgiving, play a week earlier. Play week zero. Okay. And give the two bye weeks. Yeah. Make the season longer. Like, I mean, one thing I think a lot of college football fans would like is a longer season. Stretch out the inventory in, yeah. in the early August. Um, so, yeah, you get a bye. Then you go to USC November 16th. Tough. You don't know what USC is going to have either, by the way. I, I mean, is Lincoln Riley going to be there next year? I don't know. I don't, Caleb Williams will be gone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. November 23rd, Wisconsin and Lincoln. Okay. I mean, is what it is. And then Black Friday, Iowa. God. Boom. I mean, you're what, right. What a great, what, I mean, what a man, I mean, they're all going to be hard schedules here, but this is about as good as you could have hoped for. If you're a Nebraska fan and if you're, I just wonder what the reaction in the football office was when they saw this. I doubt there's outward reaction, but inward, I bet Matt rules like, okay, 
all right, year one, we have a, I mean, come on, year one, he walked into a, a beautiful situation, schedule rise, right? Wouldn't you agree? Year two, this is about as good as you, you could have gotten. It's it's literally about as good as you could have hoped for. So look at, the, I'm looking at USC. And by good, I mean manageable. So UCLA's only November road trip to like the traditional Big Ten is Nebraska. Their other November road games, Washington. So that's a break. Nebraska gets UCLA and Lincoln in November. That's the only time the Bruins travel east in November. USC, Nebraska gets to go out there. Uh, Nebraska is the only team that will play a conference game in L.A. against USC in November. Uh, they go to Washington on November 2nd, and then they go to UCLA on November 23rd. So, like, the way it matched up with these L.A. teams for Nebraska, they, they, they got a really good setup there. They did, and it's, it's, and it's still it's a fun schedule for the fans. I mean, you get – you get, I mean, what I'm talking about, it's if you're just – not going to the games if you're just a viewer you get Ohio, you get the Ohio State and USC games and if you're and if you're a traveling Nebraska fan and you and you have the means to go to every game i mean a season with at Ohio State and at USC i mean that's you're going to historic venues like think about this for Oregon on November 2nd Oregon, Oregon plays at Michigan oh. on November 16th oh. Oregon plays at Wisconsin Oh, see, that's the other thing about this, this new Big Ten. These matchups are incredible for fans. For They're incredible. that or, You're going to get Oregon-Wisconsin regular season games. On November 2nd. Yeah. Think about this one. Washington, on November 9th, travels to Penn State. Regular season. That's un unreal. That is, I mean... Come on, that's television ratings heaven. Now, right? one thing that jumped out to me, um, there are no week one Big Ten conference games this year. Hmm. Like there's twenty twenty four. Yeah, so there's week two. Uh, Maryland, <clears throat> Michigan State plays week two, but that's it. Hmm. Then in week three, you get one November. Uh, you get UCLA, Indiana. Okay. Um. So they've kind of done away with forcing so many week one games. In. And I got to think there's a lot of pushback on that because you kind of sabotage your team's seasons with a week one loss. Yeah. I mean, everybody wants to kind of get their ducks in a row before they play conference games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, think about, I mean, all you got to do is think about the impact it's had on Nebraska. It's it killed Nebraska. Right. It, the last two years. Well, it didn't kill Nebraska this year, but it, it, it impacted their season profoundly, right? Because with a win in that game, we're, we're talking about something that much a little bit different. No, you uh, USC and UCLA don't play on November thirtieth. My guess, I would guess that USC must play Notre Dame on that weekend. Still, that's usually when they would play them late in the year. What's Michigan, Ohio State, uh, Michigan, and Ohio State remains the same weekend. Okay, okay. So you could have a repeat of that game mm -hmm. in the in the title game. I would think though, in a four team or twelve team playoff era, you don't want that. Let them just play once, and if they're both playoff eligible, fine. You don't need to replay that game again. Well, Two weeks in a row. But what, what what alternative do you see? Well, there's probably going to be another team pretty close to them. I, I don't know how that the tiebreakers and the standings, but you're right. They're going to have a pretty you – know, are they going to go off the playoff poll, or is there going to be a lot of tiebreakers that they have to determine who's that second team that gets in we'll the We'll cross game? that bridge, Sean. But, yeah, good schedule for Nebraska. Real good. Um, about as good as you could have asked for. <laughs> Uh, for the Big Red, uh, when you look at how things line up, it's going to be exciting. This new Big Ten um, is going to offer a lot of fun Saturdays moving forward. We're going to have a fun Saturday, by the way, Steve Sipple in East Lansing. I think we're going to check out Bowdy's Chop House okay. Friday night. Uh, cover the game. Check us out at HuskerOnline.com. Steve Sipple will have another award-winning column. <laughs> we don't enter you in awards, but you win a lot of awards in my heart. <laughs> I appreciate it. that's that's the only award I'm. You win the awards about. on the streets. <laughs> that's the only awards I'm worried about. Um, but yeah, and then we're gonna have a post game show as always, and we're thinking about 5 p.m. Central time. So if you want to join the fun, we had about 20,000 YouTube viewers last week. Uh, great, great numbers for our post game show. 
uh, join the fun following Nebraska, Michigan State. We'll be live from East Lansing around 5 p.m. Central on the Husker Online YouTube channel. Then we'll put the replay up as well on the podcast channel shortly after. So uh, thank you again for joining us this week here on Husker Online Headlines. For Steve Sipple, I'm Sean Callahan.